Saquon Barkley was the number two overall pick in the 2018 NFL Draft. At the time, even though he was seen as the best talent at the running back position to come into the NFL in well over a decade, a lot of people criticized the pick. There were good players at more valuable positions was the common remark. Already, back in 2018, the idea of running backs being devalued in the modern NFL was setting in. What the issue is, is that the league is telling us what they think of running backs and what they think is, hey, you can lead the league in rushing, you can be the heart and soul of our offense, you can be the leader, you can be the guy that when we have primetime games, it's your face that's on the graphic and not our quarterback. Um, but ultimately, when it comes down to it, there is a cap on what we think your value is. Still, Barkley has proven to be an elite talent at the position as predicted. And this past summer, he was entering a year where he should be getting his second NFL contract. In the NFL, your rookie contract is automatically slated based on your draft position, allowing for pretty much no negotiation. This means your second contract is where you have the potential to make the most money. The financial goal of every young player in the NFL is to get an opportunity to sign a second contract in their mid-20s, a contract that can hopefully set them for life. And for running backs, this had been a tricky thing to do in the past few years. A trend has been emerging in the NFL where running backs, once the most heralded marquee players in the league since the 1960s, have suddenly become devalued to the point where for the past few years, every time an elite running back comes up for a new contract, there's been significant argument in sports media as to whether it's a smart move to pay them. Further, the evidence has shown that that could possibly be the case. In the past few years, running backs such as Le'Veon Bell and Ezekiel Elliott have shown that second contracts are running backs may not be the best idea. In the last few years, elite running backs like Alvin Kamara, Ezekiel Elliott, Christian McCaffrey, Joe Mixon, Derrick Henry, and Dalvin Cook had received second contracts from their original teams. Though the worth of these contracts pales in comparison to increases made by wide receivers and quarterbacks in the same period. In fact, because of the decline in value for the running back position, their contracts have stagnated as every other position in the league has seen growth, which is a natural occurrence in the NFL. New players come in and emerge as elite players for their position, and when it's time for them to sign a contract, they will become the highest paid player at their position until the next elite player emerges. This happens for every position. It happened three times this offseason for quarterbacks. It was supposed to happen for Saquon Barkley. Barkley was the Offensive Rookie of the Year in 2018. He had another good but not great year in 2019, followed by a year where he was mostly hurt and another year in recovery, and then this past year where he was a legit MVP candidate and was the main reason that his not all that talented team made the playoffs. Instead of giving him a meta-breaking contract or even just a decent long-term contract, his team decided to pay their mediocre quarterback a competitive salary instead. As much as this is really unfair for Saquon Barkley, from a business perspective, this was the best move for the team. The NFL operates on a salary cap system, which means that teams are only allowed to spend so much on players in order to keep everyone on an even playing field throughout the league. So every dollar spent on Saquon Barkley is money that can't be spent elsewhere. Further, the reality is that it's highly likely that Saquon's best playing days are behind him, even at the young age of 26. Running back is arguably the most purely athletic and physically demanding position in all of sports. And to play the position at a high level takes a young, strong, healthy body, something that most running backs won't have by the time they're 27. The running back's prime earning years will be in that aforementioned rookie contract where they can't get paid their true worth. In the last 20 years in the NFL, the leading rusher has been over the age of 25 only seven times with four of those seven times belonging to Hall of Fame legends Adrian Peterson and LaDainian Tomlinson. Worse yet, this dynamic incentivizes teams to draft running backs later in the draft so they can get high-level labor for relatively low wages. So, for their years of the greatest earning potential, they will often be underpaid commiserate to their value. Once a running back is ready to get a chance at the lucrative second contract, they will be in a disempowered position because historically, it's understood that their most valuable years are behind them. Smart teams will let them move on and find cheaper labor on the free market, or as in Saquon's case, strong arm them to take lower pay than they're worth, which isn't hard because there is an abundance of good labor on the market. 
This offseason, three high-end running backs were free agents late into the offseason and all had to take cheap one-year deals in order to find jobs. Vince can draft him now, have that four-year deal, that contract, then tag him, not tag him, then pick up his fifth-year option, option yeah. and then tag him twice, and you're seven, and that's seven years. And then in the sport that we play, there's the, the analytics behind it or the stats behind it that after a running back is in their age 28, their production goes down. You can have a certain running back for a low price for seven years. And we're the one that take the most mileage. We're the one, I mean, if, if I don't know if, like you said, some of your fans might not watch NFL games, but if you ever tune into a, a New York Giants game or a Giants game this year, there's times where I had 40 touches. <laughs> and there's a point in time in the season where I was 40% of our offense. I, I finished, I think I finished around 30% of offense production for our team. And yeah. I mean, if you don't gotta be a math major, that's, that's a lot. This is unheard of at any other position in the NFL. Usually players who are top five in their positions never even hit the free agency period because teams lock them into lucrative long-term contracts. The NFL is an overall conservative sports organization. And I don't mean that politically, although that is also true. That the powers that be in the NFL are resistant to change. So for years, the poor market viability of NFL running backs was ignored. Some teams kept paying and drafting them based on old school logic about their market worth. However, the league is also a copycat league. Now, most teams have finally caught up to the reality of what the running back is actually worth. And now these players are finding themselves still playing one of the most demanding positions in all of sports for less money. So Saquon Barkley, arguably the most talented running back in the NFL, one of the best running backs of his generation, had to take a one-year deal. He will make marginally more than B. John Robinson and Jameer Gibbs, two rookies who have never played in the NFL. The whole point of the rookie salary rules were to ensure that rookies were never paid more than the top veteran players at their position. Saquon is in a shitty situation. Don't get me wrong, he's made a lot of money in the last five years, more money than most people will in their lifetimes. But for the job he works, for the actual value of the labor, according to the market that he participates in, he is being shafted. He will hope to enter free agency next year, but at 27, with now six years of wear and tear on his body, it's unlikely that any team will offer him a long-term deal worth what he deserves. He's probably going to end up bouncing around the league like a mercenary for the next four or five years from team to team before ending what could have been a legendary career in relative obscurity. Now, I know it's hard to get very indignant and upset about very rich professional athletes who play a game as their job, but if you step away from that aspect and just look at things from a critical labor point of view, it's hard to look at Barkley and his peers, highly skilled and talented workers doing an incredibly hard job and not see how they're being cheated out of the true value of their labor. And more interestingly, how despite the vast wealth they do have access to, their plight for fair pay in a corporate system mimics the plight of American workers as a whole. The role that these men play in the industry that they've been dedicating their lives to since they were children is dying. And this is a bigger problem than we are giving it credit for. I know this may seem hyperbolic, but I really want to explain to you in this video that if the running back is dead, then we're all dead. And, ch and change the way we approach, the way they play the game, then we can change the rules and we could change the infrastructure and how we pay, <clears throat> how we pay running backs. Yeah. Because if we know... Because to me, running back is the hardest position to play, and I and I mean physically. And the reason why we know that is 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 the reason that you mentioned is because you can tell by the year when a, a running back kind of productivity kind of drops, right? And it's usually way earlier than people because it's harder to sustain that level of productivity for that long. Yeah. <clears throat> Whereas a quarterback, a receiver, a lineman, a linebacker, corner, you can kind of hide. You can kind of get away with not being as productive as you used to be. You can kind of get away with that. Running back, uh-uh. He's, he's about 28, dog. It's time to get him up out of here. Yeah. We're so much more disposable. Mm -hmm. The NFL is a perfect microcosm of America in my mind for that reason. Because with other sports, the players carry a certain amount, amount of power because of the numbers, because of the fact that they don't wear helmets. So they're not just seen as a thing or an object on the field. They're seen as a human being, as a person. Because you know what you gotta look them like. in the you eyes. Know, you know what they are outside of the equipment. Yeah, you know, 
NFL players are a lot easier to be uh, written off as gladiators that are disposable because they've always been so. And, you know, people will tell you all the time, whether you're talking about CTE and brain trauma and all the effects from that, or you're talking about just the regular day to day issues that most former players have to deal with. They say, you know what you signed up for. From football's earliest days until the last decade or so, running back was one of the most prestigious roles in all of sports. Football legends from the time of leather helmets up until the last 15 years were these often comparatively small, courageous and resilient gladiators. There was something majestic, beautiful and inspiring about watching running backs either power their way through obstacles and barriers in order to reach their goal or use guile and agility and quickness to make fools of would be defenders. When football is depicted on film or on TV and there's a crowning dramatic moment, it's always the long touchdown run. There's nothing like it in any other sport. It's probably one of the reasons football has resonated so well within the American psyche. The image of men using every fiber in their body to fight against the odds for the sake of a goal, for the sake of a team. It's the very mythology of American masculinity personified. Thus, running backs were some of the most popular and also well-paid professional athletes in all of sports. And now, this majestic role in football is at the risk of being phased out. And I, for one, will not stand for it. The question, though, is how did we get here? What caused this change in the game? Why would the league slowly remove one of its most appealing and magical elements? I'm going to explain this by telling the story of how two men, in my opinion, are patient zero of killing the modern NFL running back. So let's tell the story of the two men that killed the NFL running back. It's April 29th, 2006, and it's the NFL draft. And the first killer is a man named Charlie Casserly, the general manager of the Houston Texans. The Texans were a new expansion team in the NFL. They had only existed since 2002. In four years as the GM, the team had yet to produce a winning season and were so bad in 2005 that they owned the number one pick, a gift bestowed on the worst NFL team each year. It gives them the first choice on new players entering the NFL draft from college football, holding the potential to transform a team's future overnight if the right choice was made. For every Hall of Fame legend like Peyton Manning or Bruce Smith, there were at least one or two Jamarcus Russells or Andre Bruce's. This was Charlie Casserly's second first overall pick, and there was a lot of pressure for him to get it right, or everyone would be out of a job soon. To everyone with eyes that year, the most talented player coming out of college was a young man named Reggie Bush. Reggie Bush was a running back from the legendary football powerhouse, the University of Southern California, aka USC. He was a national champion and a Heisman Award winner and one of the most electrifying players in college football history. He was incredible with the ball in his hands. He could run, catch, and break big plays. He was also humble, well-spoken, and unlike so many NFL players at the time, he was clean cut and what many might call a good culture fit. As a cherry on top, he looked great with his helmet off and would be highly marketable, especially at a position with as much star power as a running back. He even dated Kim Kardashian for a while. Both on and off the field, everyone thought that there was no better player coming out of the draft that year than Reggie Bush. The only problem was that Reggie Bush was a running back. I don't think Cassidy realized it, but he was ahead of his time. For one, he didn't think that Reggie Bush was big enough to be a true, air quotes, workhorse running back, i.e. a running back that can carry the ball 20 to 30 times a game, 300 plus times a year and not break down. This was the high water mark of running backs in this era, especially ones drafted high. Backs in the previous years like Cedric Benson and Willis McGahee, Larry Johnson and Steven Jackson were 20 to 30 pounds heavier than the comparatively spelt Reggie Bush. But Cashley thought that another player at another important position was going to be better for his team in the long run. And he shocked the world by drafting Mario Williams, a defensive edge from a smaller and unheralded school with the first overall pick. Reggie Bush went second to the New Orleans Saints. This move by Cassidy was met with a lot of skepticism at the time, but Cassidy was vindicated in the end. Williams ended up being an elite pass rusher for most of his 10 year career. Meanwhile, Bush was often injured and rarely flashed the big play ability that made him a star in college. And much as Cassidy predicted, he never carried the full load as a running back. In fact, he often played second fiddle to the other killer of the NFL running back. Paradoxically, another NFL running back on the Saints named Pierre Thomas. 
Unlike Reggie Bush, Pierre Thomas was an undrafted free agent from non-football powerhouse the University of Illinois. If the number one pick meant that you were seen as the best player coming out of college, to be an undrafted player was the equivalent of when the lights come on at the end of the night at a bar and you're looking to see who's left to take home in desperation. Thomas was undrafted in 2007 and had to sign a UDFA contract for the league minimum and fight hard to make the team. Thomas started out on special teams, but after some injuries, found himself as a lead back on one of the NFL's best offenses. He didn't do much his first year, but three out of the next five years, he would lead the team in rushing, playing as much, if not more, than Reggie Bush on a team that won the Super Bowl in 2010. While Bush was being paid nearly $10 million a year to be a small role player, Thomas was being paid less than a million a year to do basically the same thing. After that Super Bowl win in 2010, the writing was on the wall. Bush did not get offered a second contract and moved on while Thomas signed a comparatively cheap extension and stayed with the team for a full seven seasons. Now, Reggie Bush had a decent career. He was no scrub, but he never amounted to what people saw from him in college. This isn't new. He wasn't the first high draft pick at any position to not pan out to their perceived potential, but he was outplayed on a team by a player who made far less than him, who was allocated much less resources for the team. And the Texans who passed on him got a better player in the process. And at the same time, Pierre Thomas and the Saints got the same level of production for around $9 million less money. At the time, I don't think people realized what had just happened what the league had just proven about the running back position and the evolution of football as a whole. Everything that running backs are going through now was probably set into motion then. Still in the early 2010s, Bush did get two more multi-year, multi-million dollar contracts before his playing career was over. Even as a non-workhorse running back who never lived up to the potential, he remained a valuable commodity valued at his true worth. But in today's NFL, only 10 plus years later, he'd never get these opportunities. As a final proof of what's going on here, let's look at last year's Super Bowl. Last year, the Super Bowl was played between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Kansas City Chiefs. Both teams employ what is referred to as running back by committee. Instead of having one highly skilled and well-paid running back that can do everything, both teams had two or three to cover all the bases. The Chiefs did have a first round draft pick running back on their team. His name was Clyde Edwards Hilaire, and he touched the ball a total of zero times in the game. He was a complete non-factor and hasn't been very valuable this whole time during his early career. Instead, the Chiefs rushing attack was led by Isaiah Pacheco, a seventh round rookie and one of the last players picked in last year's draft who emerged as the lead back over the course of the season. Along with him is Jarek McKinnon, an aging journeyman who emerged as a pass catching back earlier in the year. The Eagles are even deeper in the strategy. They were led by their main back, Miles Sanders, who was drafted in the second round in 2019 and two other later round picks. Sanders, who is a talented back, was then not re-signed in free agency the following year. He was signed by the Carolina Panthers for a modest contract and was replaced by talented journeymen for chump change. For the amount that Miles Sanders will make this year, the Eagles are paying all of their running backs and still will have millions of dollars left over. These two championship level teams would probably have never given Saquon Barkley a shot if he were a free agent. And as of writing, they have not even bothered to take a look at high end running backs still on the free agent market, such as Kareem Hunt, Ezekiel Elliott or Dalvin Cook. Backs that would no doubt improve their teams, but cost more than what they want to pay for this position of low value. You have you have marquee running backs for sure. But what you've seen during this generation and during this time is teams have gotten hit to the fact that that running back that you get in the second or third round of the draft can possibly give you just as much, if not more production as the running back that you took at the top of the first round. And if you could get that kind of production from somebody in the fourth round, why, why use a first round pick on a player of that caliber? And if you know that the first round pick determines how much money, like basically how much money you're slotted to get paid is determined by your draft stock, your draft position. So basically with the way it is now, if the team knows we can wait until the second or third or fourth or fifth round to draft a running back or bring in an undrafted player, that's happened, where a guy comes in off the street right. and all of a sudden is, is your bell cow for the year. Right. Okay. Now, that's not regular, that's not normal, but it has happened. Right. You know what I mean? And when you see examples of that with uh, Philip yeah, Lindsay, you have Le'Veon Bell who holds out and decides that he's going to sit out for a year and 
the team misses the playoffs, but during that time, you have a rookie come in uh, 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 that actually makes a Pro Bowl. All of a sudden, you look at Le'Veon and say, do I really want to give him 50, 60, 70 million dollars? My thing was like, I got to be better than who's the running back who has the best hands. I got to have better hands than him. Who's the running back with the best, uh, you know, third down routes. I got to be, I got to have better routes. And so you do, you do, you do what you can to maximize your value so that you stay on the field. The flip side of that is if you keep staying on the field as a running back, you know, uh, you lose value in their eyes because you have more wear and tear on you. You know what right. I mean? So, so you're always, you're always being measured with this metric of, yeah, you could do this, but it also, the byproduct of that is this. Um, and as a running back, that's very unique, you know, um, and to answer your question, the toll it took was, I mean, there's a lot, you know, I still got lingering injuries, uh, um, but, you know, luckily I was, you know, I hit early and, you know, I was able to get a, a, a payday. You know, I still, you know, they still robbed me for labor early, for sure. Right. You know, I, 2010, I was on minimum rookie undrafted salary and I led the league in rushing. And then the next year I was a pro bowler, um, you know, top five rushing, top, top, top five league in the touchdowns. And I was, again, minimum league. And so they got two years of free labor, which, again, in their eyes is good business. But to me, it's like, yo, you robbed me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. I, I I gave you 16 million, 15 million worth of production, but only got $500,000. On one level, that's awful. But to an extent, that's just good business. This is the reality of what the position is worth now. Not paying a running back is the smart move business-wise. Those dollars that would go to a top-end running back can pay other people on the team whose labor is much less difficult to replace. And this is because the labor that running backs provide can be easily replicated and replaced to a relatively decent level by inferior players. Barkley is a victim of the times of the marketplace and the evolution of the game. But here's my thing. Much like dinosaurs turning into birds, there's a lot of logical reasons why things change over time. But unlike evolution happening in the animal kingdom, the way this works isn't purely a happenstance of natural environmental factors. In humans and in sports and games, these things evolve greatly because of human behavior and decision. And in football's case, it's questionable whether this evolution is just due to innovation in the game or engineering of the sport with specific goals in mind, goals that completely disregard what it takes and what it feels like to be an NFL running back. There are actual agendas, right, that are played out from the top down, from an ownership perspective down through the coaching staff, through the media and all the rest of the stuff. And when you look at running backs, right, most people would just say, all right, this just isn't the time of the running back. I'm always saying like quarterbacks don't play our position, our, our sport. They play an entirely different sport than us. And they're like, you're just a hater. Like, I'm not a hater, though. I lived it. I'm in training camp. And while I, I'm getting ready for war, because I got to go hit 300 pound cats and run away from 250 pound cats who squat a cow. I got to go to I got to mentally prepare for that quarterbacks over here playing golf on the field because they have red jerseys on and they ain't afraid of getting hit. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's not a reality they have to, they have to, they have to think about. And even in the games, if you hit them too hard, you penalize your team. So defenders are like, mm, I'm gonna get them, but I ain't, like, I ain't gonna get them. So the question is, what changed? And the short answer to that is several rules that make passing much easier in the NFL but the reasons why those rules exist is a little bit more complex. A relatively uncritical glance would tell you that the biggest factor in the NFL's rule changes have ostensibly been about the sake of player safety. In the late 2000s, the issue of the NFL's brutality became a big focal point for the league and fans of the game. Multiple retired players, including many NFL legends, were suffering from significant mental and behavioral health issues, often causing debilitating conditions, drug addiction, depression, and in many cases, self-deletion, with some players purposefully shooting themselves in the chest in order to preserve their brains so that their brains could be studied to see what was wrong with NFL players. This resulted in the discovery that football players had a high likelihood of contracting chronic traumatic encephalopathy, otherwise known as CTE, a brain disease caused by chronic head trauma, something that is highly likely when you play a game where 250 pound super athletes 
throw themselves each other at top speed. As a result, the NFL made numerous rule changes along with putting tons of new technology into the equipment with the goal of taking much of the wanton violence out of the game. And the places where these rules seemed to have the biggest impact on the game was in the way that defenders were allowed to tackle and challenge quarterbacks and receivers. Gone were the days just 10 or so years ago where guys could shoot themselves like missiles at defensive, unaware players as a way to enforce on-field situational control, AKA making it so if you are a receiver, you better have been really brave to come over the middle of the field if Ronnie Lott, Steve Atwater, or John Lynch was patrolling it. When you go across the middle, this is the result what happened. Get the crap knocked out of you. And for that reason, if that reason only, I'll catch that ball. Believe me, I'll catch it. I'll go in and get it just so I can sit back in the field room and say, Hawk, you seen that catch? He might even go up to the DB and say, hey, you know, you know I traded concussion for a reception. On top of this, while quarterbacks can still be hit, they couldn't be ragdolled and slammed into the ground, punished and brutalized for even attempting to throw passes. This overall is a good thing, but it has caused a massive shift in the way the game is played over the last decade and a half. And the end result, as I said earlier, is that passing is now a much safer and more efficient strategy. And what this means is that you don't need a running back the way you used to. Before, a six foot tall, 250 pound Jerome Bettis was a key part to one of the best teams of the 90s and early 2000s. And now, five foot 10, 195 pound Devon Achan looks like the biggest running back still of the NFL Check draft. The Again, a second round player and not a first round player. From the 24, on first down, a big hole for Achan, still going down the sideline. Devon Even other positions have changed. Off ball linebackers used to be the size of modern defensive ends. Guys like Brian Cox, LeVon Kirkland, Brian Erlacher, and Ray Lewis were huge, standing 6'3", 6'4", 250 pounds so they could tackle Jerome Bettis or an Eddie George or a Steven Jackson. Now, some of the top linebackers are much closer to 220 and they're closer to 5'11 and just over 6 feet because they had to get smaller and faster to play the passing game because the passing game is king in the modern NFL. The passing game is key because that is how the game evolved. And most of that is because the physicality of the game has greatly been reduced, which means that Saquon Barkley's role needs to not just be to run the ball, but to catch passes and block for the quarterback. Which by the way, and we'll come back to this later, are things he's actually still pretty good at. But it's still much cheaper to get two scrubs who can do the same two things probably harder and for a lot less money. That said, it's a little difficult to fully buy into the player safety narrative as it pertains to these core changes. While yes, I think it's undeniable that the NFL is safer, there are still many things that the NFL does that it knows makes the game less safe than it has to be. Many teams play on synthetic turf instead of natural grass, which historically is harder on players' bodies. His first real public action here is calling for the fields to be flipped to grass. This is obviously a huge conversation around it all. There are stats on the NFL player side that say like, hey, grass is more healthy for lower extremities, ankles, knees, and also every player that's ever played has said, yes, give me grass for my joints as opposed to turf. In 2022, the NFL added an extra game, extending the year and thus the wear and tear on players' bodies, and also they've been playing Thursday games for years now, which forces players to play two football games, organized train wrecks within a seven day period without adequate rest. Quarterbacks and wide receivers, two of the most focal points of modern NFL offenses are now all but illegal to hit due to the new rules for safety. But in reality, it wasn't players like them most commonly having the worst CTE symptoms. Research showed that it's predominantly offensive and defensive linemen who don't experience huge kill shot hits, but get much more frequent low impact contact. And most of the prominent stories of CTE were often defensive players. This is not to say receivers don't put themselves in huge, unique danger standing there out in the open, but historically it was other players at other positions rather than receiver or quarterback experiencing the worst health problems later in life. Lastly, the NFL doesn't pay for fucking health care for their players after they're retired. So like, it's you know, funny, they, they say it's about player safety, but they, they make you play Thursday night games. They added a game to the schedule. Like they don't give a fuck, but they don't they don't give health care to, to ex players. How how do we care about they they've hit concussion studies? Like I got I got a litany of shit. Like how do you care about player safety? 
how is it about PlayStation? It's about it's about it's about ticket sales. Like it's about it's about it's about TV contracts. Like I wish they would just keep it a buck. The game has changed in ways as by design. They want to see more touchdowns, high flying games, a lot of yards, right? Right. Well, by doing that, they've actually. It's not that the game changed and athletes changed. They changed the rules. So defensive pass interference, go, like going across the middle, ain't the same as what it used to be. Uh, the way in which you can hit a quarterback <clears throat> has changed. Right? It's like before you could only have a Michael Irvin, Jerry Rice type dude, or you couldn't go over the middle. Yeah. You, it's just it just wasn't yeah. happening, right? Um, and so now all of a sudden you can have Devontae Smith, you know, who's like a size that you never have seen in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Tyreek Hill in the nineties, you know Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill's a number one, right? That that would have never happened in in like the era we grew up watching football. It, it couldn't, it couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so so the game changes, and now Tyreek Hill is getting paid within the category that a running back would have gotten paid right. um, fifteen years ago. 15, 20 years ago. If it were purely safety, it feels like there would be different rules to change blocking and tackling, those big puffy helmets that they wear during the off season. All the linemen should probably be wearing that in every game. So if it's not player safety, we may have to get into some uncomfortable conversations about what it was that the NFL did to change its game with the maybe unintended, but end result in having guys like Saquon Barkley taking way less money than they deserve based on the market. In his book, $40 Million Slaves, sports journalist and historian William C. Roden talks about the concept of jockey syndrome, named after the dominance and then disappearance of the African-American horse jockey. Over a century ago, horse racing was one of the most prestigious sports in the entire country, probably as celebrated as football is now. And believe it or not, it was once dominated completely by black jockeys. Black jockeys had a significant advantage in that they were often current or former slaves whose whole job had been the care and training of horses. This gave them a significant edge over white jockeys who simply could not compete. Considering the prestige of the sport, as well as the significant money involved through gambling, this just could not be. So after years of dominating the sport, white folks did what they tend to do when certain types of black people get a little too much success in an area that's a little too visible for everyone's comfort, AKA they destroyed them. Only since the 1890s, when white jockeys formed anti-colored unions and virtually drove black riders off the tracks, did that profession attain its current respectability? The Jockey Club was formed and became the national administrative arm of the horse racing industry. Among its other responsibilities, the club licensed jockeys. In many cases, black jockeys were not relisted. That practice, along with a reluctance of white horse owners to hire black riders and a black exodus from the South in the face of escalating violence directed at blacks there, reduced the pool of jockeys. The root of the change was greed, money, and racism. A combination of dirty play, bureaucracy, scandal, and economics killed the black jockey as black men were at the height of the sport. And similar things have happened in American sports forever, whether it be white champions refusing to fight Jack Johnson for years so that a black man can never be the heavyweight champion or Muhammad Ali years later missing his prime years due to Vietnam because, OK, we'll have a black champion, but maybe not one that was so outspoken about racism in America. Speaking of racism in America, there's Colin Kaepernick being blackballed. Or if you want to get away from racism, which I understand probably a lot of you watching definitely do, just look at the modern NBA and how different it looks compared to how it did in the early 2000s and the 90s. I don't follow the NBA enough to die on this hill, so feel free to correct me in the comments, but changes to the rules around contact and the influx of European players has significantly reduced the level of physicality in the game and greatly reduced the amount of melanin. I don't know if the relatively smaller guys like Tyler Harrow could have the same level of success if they were still playing in an era where guys like Alonzo Mourning or Charles Oakley could basically drop the people's elbow on you if you came to the paint without the proper attitude. What was a large big man sport, usually large big black man, is now a sport more amenable to smaller perimeter shooters. And of course, of course, the NBA is still predominantly black, but it's not the same type of black sport that it was in the early 2000s. Insert Little Bill's video about Allen Iverson here.
Historically, the black male athlete has always been a site of conflict for America. For one, the racial hierarchy in this country always needs to have black men and black people in a certain position. But when that position is elevated to sports superstar, things get a little bit complicated. Not only are these black men getting extremely rich, richer than most of the people who enjoy watching them play the sport, but they also get more talkative, more vocal, sometimes more uppity. Many of them even dare to date white women. In fact, for a while, a lot of them dared to date white women. All of these things create lots of conflict for how the black athlete is perceived and treated and how there's always a constant desire to put him back in his place. White men in America's early history had always been depicted as the pinnacle of masculinity, in part due to their physical dominance in sport. But as black athletes began to encroach upon this image in the 19th and 20th century, there was both a shift in the way that athletic prowess was defined, but also a shift in rules to make it so these black athletes, whether or not they were really good or really bad, still could clearly be controlled or excised from the games that they were lucky to have the opportunity to play. Again, Roden writes. And there's no question that among some powerful white Americans, the black presence in sports was becoming a threat. At the turn of the 20th century, the prevailing wisdom among racialists was that African Americans, because of irreparable genetic deficiencies, would not survive. So for those who wished the country's Negro problem would just go away, the black athlete became an uneasy symbol of African Americans' deeply rooted presence in America. This resilience was crystallized over the next century by the predominance of African American athletes in white run sports, even under the regime of jockey syndrome. No sooner had one star or group of stars been purged than another, usually in another sport, emerged. I'm super cautious. Like, it's a red flag whenever I hear people talk about this guy's a character problem or this guy's this. this. That just means he doesn't do everything y'all tell. That means he doesn't dance. That doesn't mean that he's a problem. Right. You know what I mean? Like, most of the guys that are problem guys, they don't even really talk about like that. The guys that they talk about being a problem are the ones that don't dance. Yeah. You yeah, know what I mean? That's real. The problem guys they cover up for, you find out when somebody gets in trouble. Yeah, you find out you find, you find out, out when out. when the video when the video gets made public or when it you know and right. that's the thing, you can be a terrible human being, and people will make all of the excuses in the world for you because of your utility. Mm. But the second you realize that you are more than that utility, and you operate with that understanding, oh, they'll show you your place real quick. Mm. I say all this to say that I think a key element to the rule changes in the NFL over the last 20 years was not so much for the good of the sport, but a little bit of jockey theory. I don't think you can ignore that this alteration just so happened to shift the balance of power and focus of NFL stardom and offenses from the almost categorically black running backs who dominated the position to the still at the time predominantly white quarterback position. And that's something that's changed and I'll get to that in a second. If you look at this shift as well as the rule changes, it all begins in the early 2000s, right alongside the emergence of Peyton Manning and Tom Brady as the superstars and faces of the NFL. Manning enters the league in 1998 and Brady enters in 2000. And in 2002, it becomes illegal to hit a QB helmet to helmet. In 2005, unnecessary roughness penalties began on big hits on receivers. Brady and Manning had already become very successful, but this is where you start to see their numbers significantly expand. And I wanna be clear, cause I know people are gonna call me on this. I'm not saying that Brady and Manning weren't great or legends deserving of the top spots that they had in the NFL, but it's impossible not to see how their games change after these changes in the rules. For those who were there, when Brady first came into the league, he wasn't an elite passer. He was mostly a game manager, especially for those early championship teams that he was on. Those early Super Bowl championships were won because of defense and running games. And that's how most Super Bowl championships were won up until the late 2000s. It's not until 2005 after rule changes where Brady even posts a 4,000 yard passing season. Two years after that, he breaks almost every passing record for a season in the book when he gets Randy Moss on his team and the team goes 17 and 0 in the regular season. And then the following year, he gets hurt in the first game of the season. A low hit from a defender tears up his knee in week one. And guess what? 
The next year, they literally make that type of hit illegal. They change the rules of the entire NFL to make it so that somebody had to pay for Tom Brady missing an entire season. Regardless of how you see the racial component, recognize that the game was just different before these rule changes. QBs of the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s didn't win championships just by being great by themselves. Guys like Dan Marino, Warren Moon, Boomer Esiason, and Jim Kelly are Hall of Fame level QBs that put up great numbers but couldn't beat the truly great complete teams. Great QBs that won Super Bowls had to be surrounded by good defenses and running games like Troy Aikman in Dallas or Steve Young in Joe Montana in San Francisco. And again, young Tom Brady in New England. In fact, during that time period, it was more than possible to win a Super Bowl with a bad to mediocre quarterback. Just look at the legendary names that have won a Super Bowl, such as Trent Dilfer, Brad Johnson, Jeff Hostetler. John Elway is arguably the most talented quarterback to ever play the position, and he single-handedly took his teams to three Super Bowls earlier in his career, but he didn't win. In fact, he got blown out in most of them. He didn't win his first and then second Super Bowl until he was much older and a less effective quarterback, greatly because he had a Hall of Fame level running back on his team at the time. Today, things are the opposite. A good defense can't get you very far if you don't have an elite quarterback on the other side. Tom Brady dominated most of the decade on teams where you can't name three or four other significant players. Tom Brady was so good that he literally just joined a random team in 2020 and that team won the Super Bowl, even though they were one of the worst teams in the NFL for the preceding years. You can pretty much pencil in the Chiefs as the AFC representative in the Super Bowl every year as long as Patrick Mahomes is playing and he's only lost the Super Bowl to Tom Brady. But Mahomes also brings up another interesting issue as we circle back to whether or not race is as big a deal for the NFL as it might seem, depending on how you look at jockey syndrome. See, with all the changes in the game, to put it simply, it's easier to be a quarterback. And that has also changed what the quarterback looks like, not just in terms of race, but also in terms of height and athletic ability. Now more quarterbacks are smaller, faster, and suddenly blacker. The position has changed in many of these black quarterbacks and their high-end athletic ability more than likely years ago before the changes in the game would have been forced to play other positions instead of being allowed to play quarterback. This year, nearly half the starting quarterbacks in the NFL are of African-American descent. Three black quarterbacks were the first quarterbacks drafted in this past year's NFL draft, which has never happened before. So we will see in the future if things are really as racially motivated as I sometimes suspect, whether or not new rule changes or some other phenomenon comes to make that happen a lot less than is happening now. And to be honest, I think that actually won't be the case. But here's the thing, the racial element of jockey syndrome is not always purely about black men, but more so the types of black men that are allowed to enter into certain spaces. So while there are more black QBs than ever before, there's also a clear delineation between them and every other black position being played in the NFL. All QBs, even the black ones, tend to be more clean cut than their peers. A 2014 survey found that the vast majority of QBs in the NFL come from two parent households. I can't find data on this, but I, and I'm very open to be proven wrong, but I imagine that is probably an extreme outlier for most other NFL players. And the result of this is that although the QB position isn't as overwhelmingly white as it was in the past, that position is still very white coded. Players adhere to this code of conduct and aesthetic and players that don't adhere to that, such as Cam Newton or Lamar Jackson, are faced with scrutiny for their behavior in ways that other quarterbacks are not. The quarterback is an esteemed and protected class in the NFL, unlike the running back and their defensive counterparts. And I don't foresee a future where that changes, even if more black quarterbacks continue to enter the league. Further, I don't think white quarterbacks will ever disappear because the white quarterbacks are showing just as much athletic ability as their black counterparts. But here's the thing. We can really leave race out of it. I'm not, but if you want to, you can. Because whether it was purely player safety or jockey syndrome, the bottom line is that football changed for reasons other than natural evolution and innovation in the sport. The owners and administration, the people with power in the NFL, most of whom are billionaires, literally got in a room and decided the rules of the game needed to change to create a more exciting product 
and get more money. I'm trying to force you to look at the game beyond just a sport being played on the field, which I know is paradoxical because so many people watch football or watch any sport as an escape from those issues and topics. But the fact of the matter is, we got some bigger shit to talk about. Here. What killed the running back and what threatens to kill us all as workers and laborers is the dynamic between who has power in dictating what work and labor needs to look like and who doesn't. How do those in power value you as the worker and your labor in comparison to others? What are their goals and what are they willing to sacrifice to reach them? I said earlier that the current state of affairs for running backs is a matter of good business and that the rule changes in the NFL are for the good of the game. But we have to ask a couple of things here. One, what does the good of the game actually look like and who really should decide that? And two, at what point should good morals and good values trump good business? Tom Brady was amazing at his position. Like, you know, one of the greatest of all time at his position. But his position is a very specific skill set, and the rules have been created around that skill set to market the game, right? You can't tell me with these eyes that I've seen that Tom Brady is the greatest athlete of all time when I've seen Barry Sanders run a football. You know what I'm saying? You can't tell me that, dog. But the way in which they market this game and this league and these quarterbacks have convinced people that these underachieving quarterbacks deserve, these backup quarterbacks deserve $10 million a season because just, just in case. You know what I'm saying? Like they have that's how much they have they have they have marketed and tricked people into believing this shit. But uh uh a Saquon Barkley is like, you got what you deserve. This is the contract you signed. Well he didn't have he didn't have he didn't have any opportunity because they're not they're not they're not negotiating on the same level playing field. It it's it's uneven, it's not equitable. We should not be negotiating the same way with running backs that we negotiate with backup quarterbacks. It's not the same. And 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 they will they will not they will not change that like I, like I said unless there's public pressure and the only way to do public pressure is some kind of like some some kind of uncomfortable big display some kind of uncomfortable shit has to happen so if you're a non-sports fan and you've gotten this far you're probably asking yourself how does all of this sports ball football nonsense relate to everyday people why should regular folks care that multi-millionaire athletes aren't given a fair shot to become multi-multi-millionaire athletes? Athletes aren't auto workers or farmers or teachers. They don't provide essential labor to society. This is much ado about nothing. And there's some merit to that. But if you know me, and if you've watched any of my other videos, and feel free to go watch more after you finish this, you'll understand that this video was never actually about running backs. This video was always about capitalism. That's right, y'all. I am not Tom Grassi. Also, fuck the Packers. If the last chapter didn't reveal my power level, then just strap in as I put on my Antifa mask and use the power of George Soros himself to start the NFL running back people's revolution. Seriously, I know people probably have checked out when we started getting into race, but if you made it this far, I want you to fully hear me out here because regardless of your race and regardless of the fact that the subject of this video are again, multi-millionaire athletes, their plight is relevant to everyone in America who has ever worked for a living, who have seen their benefits shrink, their paychecks get smaller while their work days get longer. I won't scare you too much more, I promise. You can check out my other videos for that. My goal here was to use the plight of the running back, a position in football that produces some of the best moments in the sport to illustrate the folly of unfettered capitalism. We have to look at how and why both the running backs and fans are just expected to be OK with this jacked up situation just because those with the money say it's best practices for the sport. This starts with recognizing that the owners, these billionaires who've never put on pads, shouldn't be the ones to dictate what's good for the game. Hell, if you know anything about football ownership, half of them don't even watch the games. So we've established that running back labor just isn't all that valuable in the open market anymore. That is still true. That is not about to change because the game has changed and the market has shifted, which is why the league has adjusted. And the rules of capitalism say that those athletes just need to maybe 
play different positions, switch to receiver or running back, maybe even linebacker, which is actually something that's already happened. I'm pretty sure a guy like Debo Samuel would probably have been a running back in the NFL if he came out 10, 15 years ago. And that's the nature of free market capitalism and having competition in the marketplace and, and you know, all the other stuff about capitalism that we're told and how capitalism is the key to, you know, American exceptionalism and all the good things in society and that socialist egalitarian policies are so bad and all this pro-capitalism stuff is really ironic because in reality, rich people have always loved socialist policies. They love socialism when we use public money to bail out banks under Obama. The NFL itself has a ton of socialist policies. The NFL literally practices wealth redistribution through profit sharing, allowing for poor teams in cities like Cincinnati or Detroit to remain in competition with rich teams by taking part of their money. They purposely give the worst team in the NFL the first overall draft pick, rewarding failure, as they might call it. Rich people hate socialism, except when it's socialism between other rich people, then it's capitalism somehow, but I digress. The problem with the logic of players just changing their position is the same problem that we have when we tell fast food workers that they should just get other jobs. The labor that that job represents is still very much necessary. Somebody needs to do it. Somebody needs to run the ball, block for the quarterback and pick up blitzes and catch passes and screen passes and swing passes and all those things that make an NFL offense functional. But again, the running back still provides us with the best and most exciting parts of the game. Fans still want running backs and the modern game still needs it. So why are we allowing market forces to take it away? All right, if this cat is still important to the game, which he is, right? All cold weather games, all playoff games will show you that. Then let's change the pay structure. Let's say they can get out of contracts a little faster. Uh, we can we can heavy load incentives uh, off rip. Like th there are there are definitely ways to do it. But again, is that good business on their end? Right. Their job is to put the best product on the field that they can find for the least amount of money. So just by nature of those two paradigms, you're automatically going to have a predatory relationship there but what makes it even worse though is everybody knows what's happening right they know that by the end of most of these guys first contract usually they've had so much taken out of their bodies that they're not even the same player that they were when they came into the league and during the time where they're supposed to be getting compensated for that you know what i mean and and given the generational wealth that will actually fortify them for the rest of their career that's when they're told that you're not valuable enough. Problem is, is, by the end of most of these guys' first contracts, the team see them as damaged goods. Yeah. Which is crazy because y'all are the ones that damage them. If you didn't give this guy 300 carries in a year, they'd be fine. Right. But you want to use them for that capital. You want them to get yeah. that mileage put on them. They want to exploit want to that lane. Compensate them for that mile. We have a situation with the Buffalo Bills, a top tier team that has needed a good running back for years now, didn't sign Dalvin Cook, a top 10 running back that was a free agent this offseason. Instead, they are literally starting Dalvin Cook's smaller and less talented little brother, no shade, James Cook. Somehow they want to convince us that this is best for the game, but it's really what's best for the owners. What's happening in the NFL with running backs is something that labor theorists might call specialized labor. That is workers whose job is to do very specific things. This allows for a more streamlined and efficient work process, or in this case, an NFL offense. But it also has the byproduct of making the people that do that labor much more expendable and thus easy to underpay. Running, blocking, and catching, those are the core features to a top tier NFL running back. And Saquon Barkley can do all three, but it's literally cheaper to just get three different guys to do those same things at a fraction of the cost. Even if those three guys don't nearly meet Barkley's talent in any of those three areas. So the valuable and important labor of the NFL running back still gets done, but the players and fans suffer because the players get paid less and the fans see a lesser product. And the, the wildest thing is that aside from being shitty for fans and players, it's literally not how capitalism is supposed to work, at least how it's sold to us as working. If I'm not mistaken, one of the core aspects of capitalism was that talent and hard work pay off, right? No. Capitalism greatly hinges upon the concept of the profit motive. 
The profit motive basically states that businesses should be profit driven above all else, even if it means disregarding how pursuing those profits affect other people. The belief being that being profit driven will still inevitably lead to better service to customers and better products and allowing the most talented people to use those talents is beneficial to society and everyone as a whole. Those talented, ambitious, and daring people willing to take risk will create and innovate new ways of doing things for their own selfish needs, but everyone will benefit, you know, all that Ayn Rand shit. What? American media, American politics, American economy is very, very good at 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 marketing on the side of the billionaires. They have they have they have convinced American people that one day you can be a billionaire too. And is that fair that you worked hard all those years to just have your employees demand all these things? Like yeah. it, they're very good at it. All the while getting fucked yeah. in the exact same situation, yeah. just on a smaller scale. Yo, it's not even that they think they're gonna be rich, it's that they think this is just the appropriate order of the world. That could be Stockholm those syndrome. Rich yeah. here, these <laughs> rich people deserve to treat us like shit because they're rich and I deserve whatever I get because I'm not. Could be, and yeah. anybody like coming through to try to change shit like that's why they fight so hard against their own self-interest but like to them that's the closest thing to being divine yeah. they fight for them like gods and that's that's the like the wildness of capitalism and like the the culture that we've been inundated in in the west it's it's like rich people are overtly telling you yo i'm gonna i'm gonna like eat your children and and like <laughs> murder your grandparents but it's, it's but it's good for the economy <laughs> and that's legit how we tend to see the world we deify people like thomas edison steve jobs henry ford elon musk jeff bezos these men are celebrated in love for how their hard work and ingenuity transform america and the world with their products innovation hard work grit bootstraps get it out the mud all that shit. just don't Think about the people they stole ideas from or all the workers they exploited or harmed with their innovations. Don't think about the fact that factories where iPhones are made have nets on the side of them to catch people who are trying to kill themselves because of how stressful and brutal the working conditions are. Or that Teslas are so poorly made that people consistently get accidentally locked in them even when they're sometimes on fire and they can't get out their burning cars. So now there's a whole market of selling glass breaking tools as a Tesla accessory. The idea that the profit motive brings about a better product in the British society is not true. The NFL proves it and if it ever was true, those days have long since passed. Capitalism has the capacity to promote innovation to an extent, but after a certain point, capitalism and the capitalists will always realize that the greatest innovation, the greatest way to improve profit is to find ways to pay your workers less while forcing them to work more. Going back to Henry Ford, he's best known for the assembly line. Cars used to take weeks to make, required the labor of multiple skilled mechanics, electricians, and engineers, and thus were much more expensive, making them only affordable to the rich. Then Ford created the assembly line, and the assembly line revolutionized car production and was so amazing that it was copied by other industries as well. You can see assembly lines influence in how you get your fast food, how you get your shoes, how your Amazon packages are delivered. This definitely benefited the auto industry over the long run and made cars cheaper and more affordable for more people to buy them. But assembly line work is grueling and low skill. And because those workers are less skilled, they're easier to replace, which means that Ford could pay them less and less money and replace anyone that was making an issue about how much they were being paid. Thus, for all the work that goes on in an assembly line, people losing limbs and creating calluses on their hands, trying to plug and pull the same piece into a car for hours in the entire day, they can't even afford to buy the product they're helping to make. Even now, as cars are made from plastic instead of metal and McDonald's hamburgers are made from pink slime and Marvel movies have awful CGI and some of the best teams have running backs that won't even be in the NFL in 2025. And all of the people, the real humans responsible for this labor are being paid far less than what the value of that labor is worth. The entirety of this phenomenon is something called racing to the bottom, which is basically capitalist corporations, people with the power to enforce and alter policies, deciding that it's more valuable for them 
to have low skilled labor be responsible for really important things. And those important things become less valuable in the long run and the labor becomes less valuable in the long run. But because it's essential work, things still have to get done and people will still have to pay. But the only people that truly profit in this equation are the people that are least affected by the problem. This same logic is also used to excuse low pay and support for teachers and social workers, healthcare providers, truck drivers, and so many forms of extremely important but devalued labor. People being paid less than livable wages despite the fact that their jobs are literally essential to everyday life. Many of these people were some of the first people to report back to work before COVID was over. FYI, COVID is not over, please get your vaccines. And some of these people literally never stopped working even during the height of the pandemic. And we, the consumer, are not really seeing a better product. We're maybe getting it for cheaper. And the shareholders and executives at the top of the food chain see yearly increases in profits. I'm sure you've already heard that during COVID, as everyone else was suffering, the top 1% of incomes got even bigger. So it doesn't matter that Reggie Bush didn't become the next Barry Sanders. It doesn't matter that three or four mediocre running backs can do the same job as Saquon Barkley. The labor that they do is not only still valuable and entertaining, it's grueling for them. Their humanity is still valuable. And there definitely needs to be a reckoning with the fact that the changes in evolution in the game did not come from a natural process. It came from those above deciding to change the game in a way that increased their profits. And, and I know that some people are going to be like, well, the players should just be grateful to get as much money as they're getting, especially running backs, because they're so easy to replace. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why I brought up the racial component, because you can't not notice that we're talking about 99 percent of NFL owners being old white billionaires and 99 percent of NFL running backs being young black men. Surely any football player should be thankful for the fact that they get paid obscene amounts of money to play a sport, to play a game. And there is minimal chance of death, at least during your playing day. So sure, but not to the point where they should be OK with being exploited in an unfair situation, that they should be OK with how much money their work generates and they don't get the biggest piece of that pie. Instead, it goes to these old white men who've never put on a helmet. Aaron Foster and Aaron Maben both put their bodies on the line literally to play that game and to make that money. You could argue that they should be grateful and that they inherited world class athleticism, maybe, but they still put in the work to get where they are. Yeah, that is that is like, wild. The idea is that this is an honor and a privilege. And how dare you have the audacity not to take it with a smile and say thank you. Right. You know what I mean? And yeah. that. That was always my big, like when I walked away from the game, I had more football in me. I had a lot more football in me, but I didn't have the business of football in me anymore. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a love for um, the entire process that I had at one, at one point in time. You know what I mean? And, and that's, a, that's a very real thing for a lot of players, especially now. And think about it that guys my age and younger are the first generation that even knows about CTE and you know what I mean? Like uh, uh, the, the real results of brain trauma, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, right. and think about it like this, it's like, man, I haven't, I haven't played the game in, in 10 years, you know what I mean? But I know for a fact, I played it since I was five years old, you know what I'm saying? So there's no way that I don't have some type of bullshit in my future as a result of this game. And for me to be the guy now, like the only reason you know me now is because of what's in my head. You yeah. know what I mean? Like my intellect, my art, my 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 talent, like everything that's in my head is literally what makes me who I am now. And that's the thing that I have to worry about literally being ripped, ripped apart at some point. Um, how many of us would have actually played if we knew that? Sure. You know what I mean? My, so and the playing in the NFL was a privilege. What the fuck is you talk like like by the by the by the definition of privilege like you can you can you can def I guess you can categorize anything as a privilege you know our side is a privilege right but the way they 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 market it is like it's a privilege to play in the city like no doggy it's a right I I I bully my way here like I earned this like how's that a privilege and then and then from that they 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 take from you 
um, your your humanity about how you got there. They take from you um, what I what I feel is like regular working labor conditions. Like you have like you have to be able to bang for for your for your fellow employees. Meanwhile, the strongest predictor of being rich in America is being born rich. We create this fantasy about our millionaires and billionaires being self-made, but the vast majority of rich people, the people that we celebrate, often were rich before they became famous. Jeff Bezos, we talk about how he started Amazon from his garage, but not about the fact that he got a $250,000 investment from his parents. When you hear people say that these players should be grateful, what you're hearing is a class and low-key racist dog whistle. The idea that those born rich and powerful deserve that wealth and power by some divine right, and if they choose to share that wealth with you, the lowly football player, whether you're a black and from an inner city neighborhood, or the litany of white rural players from small country towns destroyed by neoliberal policies, you should be fine. In fact, you should be so lucky. And once again, this is why it's universal, because it's not just running backs. It's everyone who has a job. People don't want to raise the minimum wage for McDonald's workers like motherfuckers don't eat McDonald's. People think that McDonald's is for high school kids like you wake up at 9 a.m. and get your chicken biscuit from a teenager who's going to high school. Those kids are in school. That person serving you that chicken biscuit at 9 a.m. is a young adult that needs to pay their bills. And before you say, well, that young person should just go get a better job if they want better pay. My question is, who is going to serve you your chicken biscuit then? I just don't understand it. But like they have conditioned the society into thinking that sports figures and athletes, it's it's a separate entity from the workforce. Like it's brilliant for the ownership and the people who own these organizations and the leagues. It's it's brilliant. Like it's a brilliant marketing. It's job job well done. <clears throat> but and also you don't get the 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 empathy from uh you know your blue collar workers, mm -hmm. right? You don't get you don't get that because it's still a labor issue. It's a it's a labor issue on a on a on a on a much grander scale. And I could I could lobby for better work conditions. I could lobby for healthcare. I could lobby for all these things, not being understanding that this is a lot of money. You know what I mean? I, 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 all those things could be true at once, but that which is in the micro is in the macro. If they fucking us at, at this scale, they definitely fucking you on a smaller scale. And that is the bigger issue is like once you realize that, once people realize that, man, I don't know how many movements socially across this nation's history have happened because sports or happened because major issues, entertainment, whatever the case may be, has has ushered those conversations into public consciousness and then has and has trickled down into the regular average day life. That happens all the time, which is why entertainment, representation, all that shit is very important and why we would bang for that shit all the time because it matters in the day to day life. But like they have done such a good job of marketing themselves as yeah. giving these poor people opportunities that when we bang for anything, we're ungrateful. And like when people really start waking up, it's like, man, my boss is doing the same thing as these bosses. Like that's when real change happens. Football and sports in general are unique because it's the closest thing that exists in America that's a true meritocracy, at least with the players, of course. America has this mythology about bootstrap politics and hard work, innovation, playing golf. And that's not true, except for on the field or the court or anywhere else where sport is being played. And I think that's why we love sports so much universally. The football stadium is the only place where you'll see every social, political, sexual, or ethnic group represented and unbelievably united behind one specific cause. Because in the confines of the game, those ideologies and identities get flattened into working together and supporting a goal. Sports is the only place where the American myth is still real and the winners actually deserve to win because they were truly the most talented and most innovative. NFL players are in the NFL because nine times out of 10, they represent the best possible laborers for the work that is professional football. Meanwhile, the owners and capitalists, their goal is making money. They have comfy chairs that they sit in while the real work is being done on the field. And we're just supposed to take their word for it that this is the best the NFL can be as we watch Alexander Madison 
run for three yards a carry this season. I am not grateful for this. In fact, if anything, the owners of the NFL need to be grateful for me. It's my dollars and eyes, the dollars and eyes of the fans that generate the billions or trillions of dollars that the NFL makes. And the NFL splits this money 50-50 between 32 NFL owners and 1,700 plus NFL players. There is no more clear example of the tyranny of capitalism than these old frail men holding the power and profiting 50% of this billion dollar industry based completely off of these world-class athletes' bodies that are literally shaving years off their life and sacrificing their bodies for the sake of glory and our entertainment. You tell me who should be grateful for who in that equation. And while you're at it, tell me how most any workplace in this country under capitalism is all that different. I know when we think of workers' rights, millionaire professional athletes are not who should come to mind. I don't want it to be mistaken that I don't see a level of grossness in the very nature of professional sports in the face of poverty across the country and the world. And all of these running backs are already one percenters who still see more money in their short careers, yada, 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 I already explained this. But I also know that I could talk about this issue and hopefully people can understand and recognize that their plight is much more similar than it is apart. As with all forms of real value in our world, the source of said value is not from the top down, but from the bottom up. The value and power and talent is not from the capitalists who control the means of production, but with the laborers who make that production possible. And the laborers need to take action to rebalance that power to make things not just more fair for their labor, but also genuinely better for the sport. Unfortunately, the NFL has a players union that just agreed to a 10 year deal only back in 2020. So per that agreement, the next time the players could legally do anything about this problem would be well after many of them have played their last down. But I don't know, strikes are growing in popularity these days. It's no wonder why strikes are up in the United States 50% since 2022, and more and more people are seeking to take power from the capitalists. Because a lot of people, especially after COVID, looked at this system and said, whoa, Y'all motherfuckers really don't care if we live or die. And we've been working our ass off thinking that this is the best it can be. And now that we know things are different, y'all might have to run some checks. And that's what NFL running backs should do. It may be ugly. I may enjoy Madden 24 or 25 a bit less, and it might ruin the NFL season. And that would suck. But I would be much happier to get a better version of the sport in 2026 than to watch Kyron Williams start another game for the Los Angeles Rams. If these folks want their money, they're gonna have to organize and take it from the people that owe it to them. And that's not just me talking about NFL running backs. Speaking of organizing with like-minded people, this video is only possible because of an organization that I joined a few years ago called Nebula. I pride myself on making content that on one end can be very challenging, very provocative, and gets out the types of ideas that I think are important to get out here on YouTube and social media, sometimes trying to counteract the worst ideas that seem to always get out there. On the other end, I also like to make ridiculous videos about anime or obscure rappers from the mid 90s. And what I found is that depending on which way the wind blows, a video may get tons of support from YouTube's algorithm, or it may die on the vine. And it's almost impossible to perfectly predict which one is gonna happen when. Thankfully, I've collected with like-minded content creators to create Nebula. Nebula is an independent streaming service that doesn't so much replace YouTube, but represents a premier venue for YouTube-like and above content to be consumed by you, the viewer, without you or I worrying about whether or not the algorithm will show you a video, without ads, without sponsored ad reads, and more than likely content that has not been cut or censored to get through YouTube's content ID systems and all these other systems that you all don't see on the back end that make every video upload an adventure. So on Nebula, you're finding content like my own politically driven and or pop culture driven analysis with a black edge, but you're also finding Legal Eagle, you're also finding Princess Weeks, you're also finding Jacob Geller, you're finding an abundance of different content creators, all giving you not just uncut versions of their YouTube content, but also independent content that you cannot find anywhere else. 
Some of that independent content comes in the form of Nebula classes, which are classes that Nebula creators are providing with the hopes of giving you insight into our creative process so that you understand more about how we do what we do. More significantly though, Nebula has started a renewed emphasis on original content that isn't just independent content, but things that literally cannot be done on YouTube, things that are bigger, closer to, we're thinking Netflix specials or independent films. Philosophy Tube has already released her stage play, Real Life Lore, has an entire series on modern conflicts in the Middle East. If for whatever reason you aren't interested in all that Nebula offers, understand that by signing up for Nebula, you are supporting me as a creator so that I can keep making the type of content that you just finished watching. So if you're up for it, you can sign up for Nebula by clicking the link in my description and get either a monthly subscription or a full year subscription with up to 40% off. I wanna say thank you so much to everyone that watched this long and thank you to Nebula for sponsoring the video. Peace.